Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today we're joined by 18-year National Hockey League veteran and current director of goaltending for the Montreal Canadiens, Sean Burke. Sean is the director of goaltending for the Montreal Canadiens. He played 18 seasons in the National Hockey League for the New Jersey Devils, Hartford Whalers, Carolina Hurricanes, Vancouver Canucks, Philadelphia Flyers, Florida Panthers, Phoenix Coyotes, Tampa Bay Lightning, and Los Angeles Kings. On March 4, 2008, the Phoenix Coyotes hired Sean to become its director of prospect development. He was also the assistant to the general manager and the Coyotes goaltending coach. In September 2016, Burke joined the Montreal Canadiens as a professional scout. On July 25, 2017, he was announced as the general manager for Canada's men's team for the 2018 Winter Olympics in Peyong Chang. Currently, Sean is the director of goaltending for the Montreal Canadiens. Excellent conversation that we had with Sean about life, about goaltending, about his mentors as goalie coaches and what he's taken from them and used throughout, the, throughout his career as a goalie coach and in management. It's a really fantastic conversation. I learned a ton from Sean. Great hockey man. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Berkey. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure, Anthony. Good to talk to you, bud. It's going to be a great hour here for our listeners. Uh, someone that's been involved in high-level hockey his entire life, 18 years in the National Hockey League, 820 games. Let me ask you this question to start off. I mean, aside from talent, Berkey, obviously you were good at what you did. What qualities do, do you felt kept you in the game for so long? Well, I, I really think, uh, I know it's, it sounds almost cliche, but just hard work. You know, I, I believe I was a player when I was younger that, uh, you know, had some talent. I don't think anybody gets to the National Hockey League without a certain amount of talent, but I, I don't really believe that was the biggest factor. I was a kid that really liked a lot of sports. You know, hockey wasn't, in those days, I, I don't think kids focused on just one sport like they do now or, or almost like they have to now. Yeah. So I just played a lot of different sports and, uh, I was athletic. I don't know if I was so talented in hockey. I was just more athletic. And then when I decided hockey was something I really enjoyed and wanted to focus on, I think I learned early that uh, work ethic and dedication and those sort of things can take you a long way. And I just continued to do that right through my NHL career. How important in the process, you mentioned playing multiple sports with your parents. I mean, again, we're talking now, it seems like everything's so hyper-specialized, right? You've got camps for this, year-round camps for that. Was it one of those deals where, I know, speaking like my father, hey, you know, we're not going to create the path. We'll, we'll help you along the path, but it's got to be you that dictates the path. Was that something similar in terms and measures of how your parents brought you up? Yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky. You know, my parents actually were divorced when I was young. So okay. I grew up, I grew up from the time I was eight years old. I grew up with my dad. Okay. And he was a pretty tough guy in terms of discipline. He felt sure. that if you're going to do something, you do it right. And I remember him saying that to me over and over when I was a kid, if you're going to do something, do it right. Don't, don't just go through yeah. the motions. So yeah. his attitude was, Hey, I'll support you. And, uh, you know, I'll be there and anything you do, as long as you're putting the effort in, I can see that you're going to really work at it. If you're not going to work at it, find something else. And I really look back at, at how valuable that was to me because it was, it was a sacrifice in our family. We had four kids and wow. for any of us to play a sport, the, the cost and the, and the amount of time, just that's the way it was going to be. There was going to be an effort made to help any of the kids pursue anything they wanted. But it was going to be up to us individually to put the time and effort in. And, uh, and so I learned that early on that, you know, I wasn't just playing for fun. I, I enjoyed it, but I, if I was yep. going to do it and get serious, but I was going to have to work at it. I swear I, that's probably verbatim the message that we had uh, growing up from my father. We talk about this with our young athletes now. Probably the two most important qualities that you can possess are consistency and intent. You've got to come back to do it because you're not going to get good at it. But if you just check the box while you do it, you're not going to get good at it either. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the position, obviously, goaltending. Goalies in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, there's, our listeners, Berkey here, are, are going to be performance coaches, head coaches, uh, physical therapists, but fans as well. 
Talk to me a, a little bit about being a goaltender in the 90s and 2000s. Was there like a contrast in styles as we see now? Was there a big difference in the position? I, I think really it goes back to what we talked about in that first question was, to me, goaltending, especially the way I learned it, was about being an athlete. That was uh-huh. the first thing, being an athlete. Yep. And I don't yep. know that nowadays when you talk about goaltending, that the first thing that people would say is, you know, you want, you want a guy to be very athletic. There are, there, there are some great athletes out there playing the the position right now, but the game has developed to a point where it's much more technical coaching, goaltending coaching specifically has really, you know, especially since the two thousands, I think Patrick Waugh was maybe the first guy that we all heard about had a full-time goalie coach guy that, you know, you could see molded his style. Yep. And, you know, I think that since then, we've all realized that, yeah, there's a, there's a big technical component to the position, but I think growing up, my biggest advantage and a lot of the guys who played in, in, as you said, the nineties and the two thousands, the Ron Hextalls, the yep. Ole Colzigs, guys like this, we went out with more of an attitude. We're going to battle. We're going to compete. We're going to do whatever we have to do to stop the puck. And then the technical side of it was sort of put on the back burner. Yeah. But for me, fortunately, I played long enough that I kind of came into that next sort of phase where I learned, surprisingly, the technical side of the game halfway through my career. So you were flying by through just by athleticism through that. By year. athleticism, by compete, <laughs> by, you know, hey, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to outwork the guy across from me. And, you know, hockey really does come down to a one on one battle everywhere on the ice at some point, including when, when you're making a save. It's you against sure. the guy shooting. Yeah. So my attitude was I'm going to outwork people. But as I got older and I slowed down a little bit and uh, the game changed, I had to adjust as well. And that's where I got very lucky to come across Benoit Lair, who's not coincidentally in New York right now, where Shesterkin is having probably one of the best seasons of goal he's had in a long time. Benoit Lair was a goalie coach for me okay. uh, that really changed my game for the better and, and allowed me to stay in the league. Could you expand on that for me a little bit? You said technical. You said changed your game. I always talk to Misha about this, by the way. You know, I I played the game, not not at the National Hockey League level, but the college level. But when I speak to hockey people that have been in it their entire life, I feel almost like a, not a fraud, but like really understanding the game, the technicalities of the position. You know, you're playing in the National Hockey League. You get a goaltending coach, Benoit, uh, was it Allaire? As a- Benoit Allaire, yeah. Yeah, Benoit. and he's coming in now and and giving you this technical wisdom that, it's almost like an aha moment. Was it not? Oh, definitely. And I remember the moment. I was traded to Arizona in 1999 from Florida, where I was really struggling. You know, I had been in the league for 10 years yeah, and really felt lost, to be quite honest. I'd step on the ice just with what we talked about, an attitude of working hard and competing. But it wasn't enough anymore because, quite honestly, at that point, the game was changing. And, you know, I, I needed to find some things that were more stable in my game. And I didn't really know where to look for that. And luckily, I got traded to Arizona. Benoit sat me down and he said, listen, I think you can be one of the top goalies in the league by changing a few things. And I, he got me at the right time because I was, I was an open book. I knew I needed to make some changes. So Benoit never played the game at the NHL level, but he understood the technical side of some of the game that I really had never thought a lot about. And, um, you know, just which leg to get up on near down with edges, where you play in the crease, how you look at, you know, reading the rush and things like that. I had just done it by instinct and um, it served me well for a while, but I really believe if I hadn't come across Benoit at that point in my career, I probably would have been a guy that would have been out of the game uh, not long after Almost efficiency, right? This idea of you can get the job done. It's like uh, riding a bike with a rusty bike chain. You cross the finish line, but the moment you get a little WD-40, mm-hmm. you, it's much more efficient, less wear and tear, and you're able to maximize the talent you're given, right? Well, I had a lot of WD-40 I needed at that point. <laughs> I, needed it, <laughs> I needed it more than I needed it between my ears. I needed it physically. Um, yep. I really was lost. I, I was a guy stepping out onto the ice some nights. More than anything, just competing. But when the games were over, even if we had won the game and even if I had played well on the surface, I would drive home a lot of nights thinking to myself, what am I doing out there? I'm, I'm just kind of lost on the ice. I don't really have a, 
game plan. I don't have anything, as you said, that's efficient that I can fall back on. I guess it was fate to a degree. And, you know, I mentioned Patrick Waugh. Well, not coincidentally either. Patrick Waugh's goalie coach was uh, Benoit's brother, Francois Lair. So wow. the Lair brothers have been <laughs> goaltending coaches in the game for a long time. And, uh, you know, Francois, I don't think is full time in the game right now, but Benoit is still in New York with the Rangers. And if you look at the career Lundquist has had and you look at what Shesterkin's doing, it's not a coincidence that this guy is, uh, has been a goaltending coach at this level. You know, it, it leads me right into coaching specifically you, and you can even use Benoit as a reference. Obviously he had a tremendous impact from a technical standpoint, but what other qualities do you possess? I'd imagine communication and confidence and trust, right? I mean, you have to believe in the product to have that to have that work. What were the qualities, regardless of what goalie coach you had at a certain time in your career that you really valued? Was it communication? Was it, hey, you got to know what you're doing first, but how did they, they get trust in your eyes? Yeah, it, it, that's, that's a real interesting question because I think one of the things that gets overlooked a lot of times in coaching is that Players really want to play for the coach when they think he's a real good person, that yep. he's a guy that has their best interests in mind. You know, we've all played for coaches who are hard asses and uh, yep. and guys that uh, the intensity and, and, you know, that that's an element of coaching. But for me personally, I, I really believe a huge part of coaching is getting the most out of your players. And yep. a guy like me, what always worked with me was knowing that you know, the coach was in my corner. We're out there trying to win together. We have the same interests. And uh, with Ben Y, I just felt from day one that I met him. He's a very good person. He's passionate. He believes in what he's doing. And so for me as a player, I responded to that. I, I looked at him and said, when I, when I had a bad game, I felt bad for Ben Y as well, because I knew the amount of work he was putting into helping me be the best athlete I could be. And yeah. so I felt like I was letting him down. And I think that when you can get that relationship between an athlete and a coach where the, the, the athlete is going out there, not just playing for himself, but he's yeah. playing for obviously his team or even an individual sport. He's playing for his coach and he, he feels a responsibility. I think you can get a lot out of people. Wow. That's uh, well stated. Well put. I want to pivot slightly. Really, sports science, strength and conditioning now is obviously that's that's a part and parcel of of, of the package in the National Hockey League. 90s, early 2000s, strength and conditioning, literally almost just introduced, right? Like we just had it. What was your process from an off-ice training standpoint during your career in the 90s? And then kind of parlaying that into, uh, you know, the late, the latter stages of your career. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's come a long way, but I, I, I sometimes really have to sit down and think about when I, when I look back that there were a lot of emphasis placed on strength and conditioning, even back when I played junior hockey back in the mid eighties. Okay. The biggest difference, the biggest difference obviously is like everything it progressed. It got to the point where it became much more scientific, more of an expertise. But when I look back at junior hockey and I'm talking 1985, 1986, I was strength training. Then we had an assistant coach, Mike Polino, yeah. He's still coaching. He's actually in the KHL right now, coaching in Russia. But, you know, he uh, he was the first guy that pulled me aside and said, hey, I'm going to give you a little program here. It's just a real simple circuit training well, with, a, with a bar. You know, you're going to do some uh, push-ups and you're going to do some curls. You're going to do some yeah. squats. So, you know, again, it wasn't that we didn't have a sort of a an understanding that, that was strength training and conditioning was an important part of being an athlete. We just didn't have the full-time understanding we didn't have the coaching people that were out there with an expertise and so into the 90s even into the nhl when i when i got there teams had strength coaches yep. and we had summer programs we had testing when we came to training camp but the biggest difference for me was it wasn't sport specific i remember going to training camp i i think i bench pressed uh you know, three days a week, all summer, my chest was big. I could bench press 250 pounds, but I blew my knee out in training camp. <laughs> you yes. know, it, yeah. We just didn't have the understanding, but guys wanted it. There was a thirst for that information. And of course, now, as we look at where we are in today's game, in every sport, it's so advanced. Oh, it, it's it's really evolved. The, the Specifically, the technology portion of it. 
looking back again towards the latter portions of your career, were you training with the team strength coach? Were you training with your own person? And then as a goaltender, what qualities did you feel off ice were critical for you to work on specifically as a goaltender? Well, that changed, you know, and okay. uh, just as we talked about it early in my career, you know, when I first broke in, I was six foot three and a half, 185 pounds. Ah. So strength to me was something like all young guys. I was looking to put on weight. I was looking to get yep. stronger. So my summer program was, was based around a lot of that. And, okay. uh, and then as I got older and, and we had more specific strength coaches and better, uh, the game evolved and, and strength training evolved and fitness. As I got near the end of my career, I did a lot of yoga and uh, yep. I did a lot more of, of sort of stretching and, and quick, quick stuff and sprinting and those sort of things. And as I got really near the end of my career and I couldn't sprint and the body was breaking down in a lot of ways, I really did a lot of focus on just making sure that I was healthy and, uh, and eating and sleeping, but the stretching. And so I think it evolved as my career career evolved, but it had all the components in it at one time or another. Absolutely. Curious as to your thoughts during your off season, specifically as a goaltender, did you view that the, the front portion of your off season is, Hey, I need to stay off the ice. Like I need to rest my hips. I need to do this. Or was it, Hey, I always had a little dose of of playing. I always had skill work. I wanted to stay sharp. Where did it fit on ice during the off season for you? Yeah, I took time off the ice right away. Yep. Just the grind and, and the, uh, the mental, you know, stress yeah. of putting that equipment on every day was really the reason for it. It, it just, yep. it was a time to get away from getting in, getting on, on the ice with, and, and putting that equipment on. I mean, that, that was something that I really enjoyed when the season ended was just having some time to not, but I, I would get in the weight room the very next day. I, I don't think I took a lot of time off ever. Okay. I can remember going to year end meetings when the season was over and you sit down with your coaching staff and talk about, you know, the summer and I'd go back, I'd, I'd leave the meeting, go to the gym and get <laughs> working out right away. I just enjoyed That's great. that. I, I felt when the season was over, you were worn down yep. physically, but I needed that time to start building my strength back up. I didn't want to waste a lot of time. Yeah. And of course, mentally, I got away from the game, which that was resting to me, was mentally getting away from being on the ice. Yep. But I didn't want to get away from the fitness side of it and the strength side of it. I wanted to get right back at it. Uh, the reason I asked that, Berkey, it's just interesting, specifically with, with your position, the, the position of goaltending. The chicken before egg or egg before chicken debate is happening right now with goaltendings and hips, right? FAI, femoacetabular impingement. That because of the unique demands of goaltenders, butterflies getting down puts a lot of wear and tear on the hips. And, uh, you know, like I said, chicken before egg, egg before chicken. Is it because kids play too much hockey? Is it because it's structural? Is it because, you know, it could be a million different reasons. But I was always curious. And I always ask goaltenders that question, how much time they spend on the ice just based on the longevity of careers and, and now with what's going on with hips. So I want to I want to pivot a little bit now to to coaching your career as a goaltender. What led you? Was it a next logical step coaching, like being a goaltender coach? What was the impetus for you saying, "Hey, I, I want to be a goaltending coach"? Uh, and and you spent quite a bit of time with Phoenix, now Arizona, as a goaltending coach. Well, first, before I'll, I'll just go back real quick again because I, I'm not sure you know this, but I have two full hip replacements. So back to the last question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, you didn't know that. I'm your, I'm your goaltender uh, sort of guy. That yeah, I, I I ended up in my career playing a long time. I was into my yeah. 40s when I retired as a, as a, an NHL player. So there was obviously a lot of wear and tear, and yeah. uh, and eventually I needed both hips fully replaced. But I knew that back near the end of my career, I, I had met with a couple doctors and they had said, listen, you just have that wear and tear that eventually you're going to need hip replacements. And I'm not sure what I would have done differently throughout my career. If there yep. was anything I could have done differently. Sure. I like to think that all the yoga and the stretching and everything I did prolong my career. I'm not sure it would have ever prevented yep. me from needing hip replacements just with the amount of time I played and the amount of stress that I put on my body. It's such a unique position and looking at research from baseball because with pitchers, you can get a ton of asymptomatic, meaning 
pitchers that don't have any symptoms, but if you got them under an MRI, you could find an impingement. You could find a rotator cuff debridement. You could find, I'd imagine that there's probably a lot of goaltenders that don't even know they have some of, of this impingement until the tail end of their career, or they, they might not know it, period. But I didn't know you had two hips. How, uh, when did that happen? At career, uh, as, as you, when you retired, did you get both of those done? Yeah. So near the end of my career, I had, um, I had some cleanup surgeries yep. done just to get the impingement you know, out of there and that sort of thing. But I, I ended up waiting probably longer than I should have, because I think at some point it just becomes quality of life. When you, yep. when you retire, the things you want to do, uh, you know, kind of center around golf and, yep. you know, stri- uh, training still, I like to, I like to do yep. a lot of biking and that kind yep. of thing. And it just got to the point where the everyday enjoyment wasn't there anymore because the hips had, had become too painful. So I waited till I was about 50. Yeah. So that's 10 years after I stopped playing and, uh, and I had both hips fully replaced and I, and I'm glad I did. I, I honestly think I, if I had done it a few years earlier, probably would have been uh, a little bit better of a thing to do. Cause I could have yeah. enjoyed a few more years, but I'm happy I did it. And I feel, I feel good now, but a lot of it is, you know, even at this age to, to enjoy life, you, you have to stay active. So I, my, my routine isn't much different than it was when I was playing, to be honest. <laughs> that's fantastic. I want to give back uh, uh, this this idea of this logical next step for you in, in goaltending. Was it w- you wanting to stay in the game? Was it just the passion for the position? What led you to get to be that be a goaltending coach at the end of your your career? Yeah, it was sort of a just a progression. When I retired, I really felt immediately like I wanted to to stay in the game. I wanted to stay active. I felt I was very lucky. I'd played that long. I had some things I could pass on, but coaching wasn't where I was headed. I I wanted to go into management. That was my first yeah. thought was be around the game at a management level. So I started out in development in Arizona with, uh, with Brad Trey living and, and yeah. uh, Don Maloney were there at the time. Yeah. And I went right in and just sat down. They, they said, let start out in development. And then I progressed into a little bit of management and doing some other things. And then I was just asked to coach. Don had come to me and said, I think, you know, you'd make a good coach. And so I started out working there. We had Brisgalov and then, you know, we had Mike Smith and, and Devin Dubin. We had a lot of big goalies that came through there. And so there was a real natural fit for me working with those guys. And I took a lot of what I had learned from Benoit Lair I on the coaching saying. side of it and put it kind of in my own package, combining it with my playing and my experience as a player. And so, yeah, there was a natural progression there. But again, I like to think that that was one and, and is one aspect of my post playing career, the, the management side and the other things I've been able to do are all part of a, of a pack is it, I, I guess I can say I've really enjoyed my post playing career too, because I had an opportunity to do a lot of things. This idea of uh, getting into coaching, specifically being a goaltending coach, you talked about your influences on Benoit, this idea, like Bruce Lee would say, absorb, modify and apply, right? Absorb the information, modify it to fit your unique environment and then apply the information. Besides your career, which was, I mean, you're going to get buy-in immediately or guys are going to listen to you immediately. You're an 18 year National Hockey League vet, but how did you build trust with your goaltenders? That's an open-ended question and it's a broad question. It might be difficult to, 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 to explain fully, but what was your process building trust? Yeah, I, I don't think it's actually that difficult a question. I, it, it's, it's more of, of probably a disappointing uh, answer because it's pretty simple. I, I, I never really thought a lot about getting by and what I thought about was helping my players. You know, what can I do to help them be the best player they can be? And and genuinely, that was sort of my satisfaction in coaching. It always has been. I had my day. I was very lucky. We can bore the listeners with the, you know, the pedigree and all that. The reality is that was long gone for me. And I looked at it that way, that coaching was now something that I could pass on I could help guys hopefully have good careers. And I think I got the buy-in because they saw that was genuine. Absolutely. Sort of like Benoit Lair. When my guys stepped out on the ice, the guys I was working with, I wanted them to go out and enjoy themselves, okay. feel like they had the game plan to be successful. And I got a lot of enjoyment out of watching that happen for them because I know that feeling of playing well and being satisfied with you know, the work you put in and then seeing the results on the ice. And I believe that that was sort of and, and is one of my 
biggest strengths is I think players see that I genuinely want to help them and, and can help them. What would a typical day look like for you as a goaltending coach in the National League? I mean, are you working with them in practice, before practice, after practice? Is there video analysis? Is it all dependent? What's a typical day look like behind the scenes? It depends on the goaltending. You know, Mike Smith, I, I go back to, you know, first of all, Brisgolov, who I think had at that point when we got him in Arizona, he had had some success in Anaheim and he was, you know, not necessarily a rookie. So his day, you know, days with guys like him are relatively simple in terms of game days. You know, there's a morning skate, you know, you get them on their on the ice, you, you get them warmed up, ready for the game. And then mo- for the most part, game days are, you know, hey, go out and play. We, we've worked on our game plan, go out and play. And then, and then the work's done on the off days, the video work. If there's things that need to be worked on on the ice, you know, you put a plan. You know, there's there's managing the the rest and and the amount of playing time, and those are those are huge things. With uh, and even more important, I think in in today's game, yes, you know, you want your guys to be fresh, mentally fresh, physically fresh. You want them to go out and give you a chance to win those games. So that really hasn't changed. But you know, Carey Price, for example, a guy that is such a veteran, has had so much success. You know, my days with him were were quite a bit different because there was a lot of hands-off, not really wanting to do too much, yeah. but also making sure that keep him sharp and on top of little things. Because his game depends so much on, you know, him being fresh and mentally ready to go because the skills and the technical side of the game are so good that if he steps on the ice sharp and ready to go, he's he's going to play well. Yeah. So that was a little bit more managing with him that way. So interesting, right? N equals one. You have to have a heat meter and everybody's based on, you know, their personality, what sure. they bring, their technical aspects. You're going to work on them differently based on the, the person you're in, fr- you're in front of. As a coach, if I, I always felt that as, you know, if I have one way of doing things, you know, I'm limiting myself and I'm limiting my players because at the end of the day, we are unique. Everybody has different yeah. skills. Everybody has a different mindset. Ultimately, you have a game plan in terms of managing the time. And as we talked about rest and those things, but you have to learn from your players, you know, coaches. <laughs> I continue to learn. I, I learned from young guy. I learned from my son who's in the industry now who played yeah. goal at a fairly high level. If you stop learning, I, I think that as a coach, you limit yourself to what you can pass on to your players because it so has true. to be a give and take. We don't know everything. No coach ever does. And, and no matter how much I played or how much experience I have, I can still learn every day from somebody I'm coaching. And if you limit yourself, uh, you're going to miss some of that. So true. We spoke a little bit before about talking about management. Could you tell me a little bit more about, I mean, management, assistant to the general manager in the Coyotes organization, general manager at Hockey Canada, the 2018 Winter Olympic team. General manager, and I want to come back to this because of what a unbelievable experience, the 2019 Spangler Cup, baby. But yeah. can you talk to me a little bit about management? You said when you ended your career, management coaching, management coaching. Start me on management with the Coyotes and then kind of walk me through how some of these opportunities came about with Hockey Canada. Yeah, well, I, I always felt management was was something that was interesting because you're you're sort of taking your experiences, but you're also coaching to a degree. You're putting staffs together. You're looking at all these different areas and you're trying to build a team and, a, and an organization and, and win. And that's that's a huge challenge. And uh, so that was always interesting to me to, to think about, hey, can I, can I do that? Am I a guy that could put together, you know, a staff, put together a coaching staff and put together a team that, that can win? And I mean, that is that is the challenge of managing. Um, and then, of course, the everyday manager of all the different things that go into that. And I like that element of coaching is real specific. You know, you, especially as a goalie coach, you've got a couple of guys you work with. You know what you're going to do for the most part every day. Management comes along with so many other factors and things that are coming out of left field at the time. And you have to really be able to think on your feet that way. So. Sure. I started doing some of that in Arizona and, and was very lucky to work with Brad Trey Living, who's having a great year in Calgary this year. He's, yep. he's an excellent general manager. Don Maloney, who was general manager of the year in Arizona. 
And then I've worked with so many other guys over the years, George McPhee and uh, yeah. Jim Nill and and different other general managers. So that is a is another area of the game that I just found really challenging, but yet really satisfying to get the opportunity to work with all these people and take things in from all of them. Management sounds very interesting. You talked this uh, about finding the right people and winning. When you're putting a staff together from a management standpoint, what, what are a couple of the qualities you look at besides the background of the individual? What do you look at in people that you're trying to hire to win? Well, you have to have a fit. Every element of your team is important. We all, yeah. we all take for granted how important the trainers are sometimes. Um, people that are around the team, they have a huge influence on the players, the attitude in the dress room, the, the environment you're creating. So to me, that's the first thing. Does, does somebody fit that? You know, everybody's not the same. Yep. You don't expect everybody to have the same disposition. But for me, I want to know that when, when players walk into a dressing room, there's a positive feeling there. There's, a, there's an environment yeah. that they're going to have a chance to be successful. And that's people. That's the kind of people you surround your players with. And, uh, and of course you need expertise, you know, I've always said that when I've managed, I want the best people around me that I can find. I, I don't need to be, nor will I ever be the smartest guy in the room. And that's yep. okay. I yep. want, I want experts in there. I want people who have specific expertise in areas that I don't. And, uh, and I think that if you can put enough of those people around you and create a positive environment, that gives your team a really good chance of winning, provided that you have Again, you have the right players, but you can go a long way, as you know, and, and most people know, yeah. with with a real positive attitude and just a great a great environment. I uh, you, you use this word environment, and I've used it on our podcast so many times. I, I think it, I stole it from the book, The Culture Code, but I took it from gardening to coaching. And I think you could take <laughs> whatever it is you're trying to do and kind of insert this word. But I say good coaches are a lot like gardeners. Gardeners don't grow flowers. They create an environment for flowers to grow. That's and great. Yeah. If you think about it, like that's what we do. You're creating yeah. from a management to a head coach, to a goalie coach, to a strength coach. I'm fond also of saying like, you know, the best program is the program the athlete believes in the most. 100%. 100%. You know, I could give you all the science in the world and you might say, hey, Anth, I don't like the program. You change something, you might think it's not as good, but you believe in that. And you know sure. what? It's amazing what happens. When, when, when things go like that, right? Well, yeah. And, 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 I, and you get to the level that we're talking about at the NHL or, or Olympic level and those things, you, there's, there's a very small difference between teams as far as talent goes yep. and, and all those other areas, you know, you NHL, you, there's a salary cap. And yep. so you can look at putting the be together the best team possible. You're limited to how much you can spend and everybody has that same limit. So, what makes a difference at the end of the day? You need, of course, top players. You need some real high-end talent. But there's teams out there we see every year that with high-end talent don't win. And it comes down to, to me, at least, a lot of the times, that environment we're talking about. How, how excited are our players to play? How much do they believe in their coaching staff and what the organization's doing? And culture gets used, that word, over and over again. But it is true. You know, when you walk into a dressing room at the NHL level, how does it feel the minute you walk in that room? Is it heavy? Is the air heavy? Is, yeah. there, a, is there a sort of a negativity or is, is this a place you want to be and you want to be successful? And that, that's created by your management. It's created by your coaches. And that's all people to me. I'm going to ask this too, because you've been involved for, for many decades in the game. So you've got millennials, Gen Z, do we need to change the way we've coached because of, uh, you know, different generations of players or do we change the approach or do we keep the approach that we have when working with millennials, Gen Z, you've got technology to deal with. You've got outside noise, more outside noise than we've ever had in, in the world right now. It's a different time. Would you change from a coaching standpoint, the athlete or the, the athlete and how we speak to the athlete, how we coach the athlete now compared to, you know, the mid 2000s? Well, I think there's always a balance in everything you do. And I, and, I, and I truly believe in coaching. Yes, we have to sometimes adjust. There's, mm -hmm. uh, everybody's not the same. Every athlete, we, you know, anybody who has kids knows that, you know, I have five of them and they're all different. They're all unique. Uh, the way that I speak to one of my children is different than the way I can speak to my other one if I'm looking to get the most out of them. As a parent, you recognize that. Sometimes as coaches, we don't, we don't want to recognize that. We want to 
look at it and say, well, this is the way, you know, I did it, or this is the way coaches talk to me. And, and, you know, but that's not really always successful because we're dealing with individuals. I think that, yeah, there's, there's a, de- a definite difference in today's athlete than there was when I was playing, but it's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. Yeah. And as a coach, I have to find out what those nuances are. And, and I have to be able, again, to get the most out of my players. And if I'm going to do that, maybe a swift kick in the ass for one player works. <laughs> for another yeah. guy, it's sitting him down and talking to him and, and figuring out what's what's bothering because he may take things more personal. And uh, yeah. and I think that, that that is the that is the gem of coaching is the good coaches figure out a way to get the most out of their players. And what I've seen from all the coaches I've been very fortunate to work with, John Cooper and Gerard Gallant, and, uh, you know, you go through just guy after guy that, that uh, I've, the, the ones that, they're all different. The coaches are all different. Their personalities yeah. are different. But the ones that are the most successful seem to be able to adjust and move with the game. And uh, that's what we're seeing. The game continues to evolve and, and as, as athletes themselves. do. Like it. Work-life balance. So playing, coaching, management. What did you do to avoid like constantly burning the candle at both ends? What was your work-life balance? It comes down to what you're trying to get out of the game. For me anyway, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I was very fortunate. I had a, a long playing career, both NHL and international. And so I, I had a, a spectrum of of experiences that range from Olympic experiences to, you know, Stanley Cup uh, playoff experiences and, and everything in between. So to me, the balance when I got out of the game was to enjoy, to enjoy the game. I, I wasn't trying to make a name for myself. I wasn't trying to prove anything. I was trying to take what I have learned and hopefully pass that on and help out in other areas. And of course, I'm extremely competitive like everybody in the game is we're, yeah. we're all looking to win at the end of the day but why are you trying to win what what is the reason you want to win and for me it it always comes back to the same thing it's i want to win because i enjoy the feeling of winning like everybody does but i like to win the right way i like to 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 feel that if we're if we're going to win we've done things it's been enjoyable our players have have enjoyed the process and of course the balance is always your family. You know, yes. it's just the sport. It's just hockey. It isn't life or death at the end of the day. And so there's more important things in life, but everything can, can work well together if you keep it in that perspective. And guitar, baby. I need to, I need oh, to, ask, man, I I need to ask, I need to ask about the guitar. Talk to me about it. When did you start playing the guitar? Yeah, well, I'm looking behind you there, and I see those two Martins, and uh, we were chatting about it earlier. And I have I have a funny story about a Martin guitar, but I can tell that another day. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I started playing back in 1987 when I joined the Olympic. Oh. The reason I started playing was simply I had a lot of time on my hands, and in those days, I was in Calgary with the national team, and. You know, we were in Europe a lot. We traveled a lot. And uh, and on my downtime, I was always a music fan with no natural music ability. I never grew up in a musical family. But I thought it was so cool to just, I loved, I loved the rock star look of a guy holding a guitar or <laughs> a woman holding a guitar and just that, you know, just that look and that. And so I started just on my own trying to play and picked up a few things along the way and learned a little bit here and there from other guys. So I've been. I've been playing a long time. Not that you would know that if you heard me play, but I have been playing a long time. Self-taught or any lessons? Uh, lessons from buddies. Never had a formal lesson. You know, self-taught to the point where I'm I'm like a lot of uh, guys who don't read music. I read tab, yep. guitar tab. Yep. And there's so many great programs now online. And things 100%. Like that. I mean, there's no excuse for if you put the time into not yep. at least be able to progress to a point that you can enjoy the instrument. Uh, and that's where I am. I like to try and pick up the guitar every single day for if even if it's for five minutes. Not always possible because I'm on the road and I'm in a hotel room right now and I don't have one with me. But yep. that's my sort of guitar is if I can just it feels good when I pick it up. Doesn't matter what kind of mood I'm in, <laughs> when I pick up a guitar, somehow I start to feel good. As crazy as it sounds, if I'll force myself even if I have to set my iPhone to five minutes, but I always try to get a touch point when I'm in town 
playing yeah. the guitar for me it's just a it's a, i don't know my mind goes somewhere different all my worries are away and and i yeah i, I i'm just one with the, the instrument you know well um, there's even some hotels now which i think is great there's hotels i stay at on the road and i'll specifically pick those kind of hotels that that'll have guitars available to the guests you're and, kidding uh, me no there's there's a number of them now and i've uh I've always thought, what a great idea. There's guests who are going to spend time in their room like I do, or you're doing game reports or things like that. And I'd, I'd love if I had just 10 minutes of a break. And so there are a few hotels around the league now that'll, that'll uh, offer guitars to the guests if they want them. You ever bring the guitar on the road on the, with a hard case? Oh, yeah. I used to bring it on the road as a player all the time. Um, and, you know, <laughs> to me, it was... Uh, you talk about a team sport and bonding and those kind of things and all the, all the bonding that you do in the dressing room or at dinner or on the road. We used to have some great nights where I would just have it in my hotel room and the team would come over guys. Uh, and, and, you know, in those days early on, you didn't charter after every game like you do now. Yep. So there was a lot more nights in hotel rooms on the road. And we had some, some good nights where just sit around and, and there's always a guy or two on every team that can play or can sing. And, uh, and you throw a few uh, Guinness in there, you can have a you can have a good party anytime in, in a hotel room. With a the what a bonding <laughs> experience! Talk about creating the environment, Berkey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to, to pivot uh, uh, one more time here in, in terms of measures of strength and conditioning and sports science. Everything now is geared towards a ton of technology. Open ended question, and I, I don't know if it's answerable, but have we swayed too far from the pendulum to measuring everything in terms of performance? Or a lot of that is, hey, you know, the, the hardest things to measure, we, we can't measure, right? Hockey sense, uh, reading and reacting, compete level. Like you can measure heart, but you can't measure heart, you know? Where do you feel uh, we are right now with this big boost in technology, whether that's analytics or sports science? I, I actually love it all. I mean, I, I okay. think that, um, you know, when you say the pendulum swing, I... I, I think it only I, I think it only swings that way too far if you know you have that attitude that that you're going to sort of put the premium on one thing. And, yes. And yes. Uh, you know, to me, the more information is always going to be better. It's how you use that information, how you interpret it, how accurate it is. You know, analytics uh, again. There's there's all kinds of arguments on analytics of gathering the information, how accurate it is. But really, if you look at it for what it is. It's numbers that tell a story. And how do you how do you take those and interpret those with what you just talked about, hockey sense and, and heart and all those things? Well, there is value in that, if you look at it that way, in my opinion. Sports science is the same thing. I want the numbers. I want to know as much about every athlete that I have as I can. And uh, But again, if, if I'm going to come to training camp and say, well, the guy that tests the best in training camp is going to be my top player – then I'm missing the point because yes. we all know that if if you did that, Wayne Gretzky would have probably played on the yeah. fourth line. Or uh, <laughs> you know, we, we we'd have guys that we we prejudge because of one specific area. So I think that that's where it's important in an organization to have a real focus on having experts in every area, making sure that you use their expertise. But you you are balanced enough to say, okay, we're going to put it all together at the end of the day, and yes. we're going to we're going to put it we're going to put a premium on the things you just talked about still in our sport, which is hockey sense is what is the most important thing. Skill, heart, all those things are 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 really going to be at the end of the day the difference mm -hmm. of what makes a top player. But Sidney Crosby is not Sidney Crosby though; it is extreme. Top level conditioning, sure. The amount of time he puts into his craft, and look what he's still doing now at this point in his career. And so, how important is that? Well, it's it's, it's very important because again, his skill level is not that much higher than a lot of other guys. But when you combine it with his conditioning and the work he does, that makes him and has been a reason for him being a top player in the league. I really like your response. It's not an either or. I think too. I think specifically with sports science, speaking on our behalf, like. I think it's really important when we communicate with decision makers that we use this idea of inform versus persuade. Informing is here are the numbers, you know, here are the context to the numbers. Berkey, you know, use these to make whatever decision you make as opposed to, hey, these are the numbers. This is why you need to do this. This is why you need to do that. Void context. That makes sense? 100%. 100%. I'll give you a good example. I, I played 
I think I played for just about every tough coach that came through the league at one time or another. John Tortorella and Mike Keenan and Ken Hitchcock. Keenan, I played, I, who, who, I, who was oh, the yeah. most demanding? Who was, I'm just curious. Who was, well, again, I've heard Keenan was just a tough dude. Um, I, uh, yeah, he, he was. And it, and him and I didn't work well together. Yeah. But again, it, it wasn't because it was more his fault than it was my fault. I look back and realize at that point in my career, he just wasn't getting out of me what he could have because I wasn't responding to the way he coached. It, uh-huh. But but it was it was successful for him with a lot of other guys. It just didn't work with me. Okay. But the one thing I, I really respected about Mike was he put a premium on conditioning. And he really, really felt that that was going to be a difference between his teams being successful. Now, looking back, he didn't have the understanding of necessarily specifically what that meant. Yeah. He just knew, I want my teams to be the top conditioned teams in the league. And unfortunately, what it did sometimes was it deconditioned the team because he went overboard. Yes. And, and it was it was too much through the course of a season with everything going on. But the philosophy was not wrong. It wasn't, it wasn't that he didn't understand that this is going to be a huge – he was sort of ahead of his time in some ways – but ultimately now where we have such expertise around, hopefully a guy like him would be able to say, okay, I, I, we're on the same page here, but now I have to take the information and I have to use it more. I have to be smarter about the way we interpret this stuff. So true. A matter of fact, it, it parlays in, in, into, into some of this. Uh, you know, I think specifically with sports testing and, and hockey testing, right? I think it's really important to have a holistic approach and being able to speak in a perfect world, sports science and strength, speak to the head coach, because obviously a conditioning test is very important for the athletes. Having said that, the right conditioning test, because if you spend all summer studying Spanish and you show up and the game is geometry, you've studied the wrong subject, right? (laughs) And essentially what you said, you actually spend less time focusing on what got you to the dance because you're worried about the Spanish test. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. Well, and you know, and the the one thing that always frustrated me about uh, about our sport, and I'm sure it's similar in other sports, but as an athlete, what frustrated me was, you know, when punishment, it was used as punishment. Yep. So for example, we have a day off planned and everybody knows we need it without understanding the science behind it. You still just understand we're kind of worn down, but you had a bad game. So the day off was taken away. Taken away. And now you're grinding all the time. And it's got a lot better that way in, in the sport now. But I think that sometimes, you know, those, the testing was done for the right reason, was we yep. want guys to work out in the summer. We yep. want to know they're doing something. It may not have been the right test or sports specifically the right test, but the philosophy behind it was right. We want guys sure. to stay in shape. There's a fear that if you come to training camp and you haven't worked, you're gonna, it's going to be exposed. Yeah. Yeah, um, but it's just got so much better that way. Now, what you're doing in the summer is actually the right stuff to prepare you for the season. Yep, it's when you get in the season and winning and losing is so important. Winning, winning being the premium, that teams can get off the page because all of a sudden it becomes punishment. Well, we're going to work harder or we're going to do more when the numbers may not indicate that that's the smartest yeah. thing to do at the time. So sure. there has to be a real, real understanding and a, and, a, and a trust between your conditioning, your sports science, and your coaching to make it really the most beneficial. Well put. 2019 Spangler Cup. Unbelievable. I, I just spoke to my brother about this. I, I, I can speak uh, from my behalf, and I know Mish would, would, would echo the same sentiments. Probably one of the most unique hockey memories I've ever had. Number one, the entire family was there, our family, which was great. My dad was there, my mother, my, my brothers, uh, uh, nieces and nephews, but a beautiful, beautiful place in DeVos, Switzerland. Could you speak about the management staff that you put together? And could you speak a little bit about, you know, the Spangler Cup and that experience that you had? Well, that that tournament, first of all, for people who don't know, is, is I think coming up on their 100th year. Yes, in the next year or two, that they will reach that mark. So it's been a tournament that's been around for a long time. It is a uh, it is a bucket list tournament for anybody yes. that likes hockey at any level, a fan, coaching, whatever, whatever. It's it's something I would recommend 
you know, you better save up for it because it isn't cheap, as you know. It's Davos, Switzerland, and uh, <laughs> and once you're there, you realize why because it's one of the most beautiful settings for a hockey team. I mean, the, the, the arena itself is like a cathedral. You can oh. attest to it. But I've been very lucky. I've done it four times now for Hockey Canada. I would have to say our year was the most enjoyable, and, I, and I'm not <laughs> discrediting any of the yeah. other years. The reason being, I saw things like I saw with your family, the yeah. whole family coming together. I got to uh, spend some time with your dad. I had a great yep. cigar with him after yeah. the tournament. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. and and you and you you guys, I know how much you enjoyed it as yeah. a family. Yeah. That's yeah. what it's about. It's about going there, winning a tournament, but doing it in a way that is it's Christmas time, it's family, it's 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 unbelievable. And and your brother Misha to me, I guess I'd say he's one of my best friends in hockey to start yeah. with. But I've learned so much from him. Just Talk about a guy. I put him on on our staff. He co-managed the team with me. He was part of the coaching staff. He's a he's a Swiss Army knife of hockey. That guy. He can he can do it all. But I've learned so much about process with him. Yeah. How hard he works, but how efficient he is with his work. And yeah. he doesn't leave out a lot of details. So when I talk about that group, that management group, I not only did I enjoy, it, but I learned a lot. And yes. um, and to win that way. To win tournaments that way, to have to have the right sort of group around you and process is, is what it's all about. And to have your family there yes. uh, is 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 so extra special. So, you know, I, I can't say enough about that tournament. What I can say is that I'm glad you got to enjoy. I'm glad you got to enjoy it with your family. And I'm glad, I'm glad I got to enjoy it with your family. Too, uh, it was unbelievable. Last question. I want to I want to uh, I want to respect your time here, Berkey, but off the script question. You've been in the game your whole life. How do you want to be remembered? Well, I'd like to be remembered um, as a guy that contributed to the game in a positive way. You know, I have kids that play. I have a son that uh, was drafted. He's now running a hockey academy. I have a six-year-old that wants to start playing, so I'm going to go through it all again. I I, I like to feel like uh, when it's all over that I was somebody that made a positive contribution to the game. and I don't know specifically what that is. Yeah, but I like to be somewhere in that list of people that they say, "Yeah, that guy was in the game a long time, and he actually was he was he was pretty good at what he did." We're not sure what he did, but <laughs> but but anything that he did touch in the game, he was pretty good at. You know, that's growing the game. That's I think the one thing about our sport that may be unique, yeah. without discrediting any other professional sports, is that we have a really really good group of people right from our players, our coaches. And it's been that way. All our superstars in our game, going back to Bobby Orr and Gordy Howe, right through Wayne and Mario and all these guys, it, they're a certain type of person. And, and I think yes. most people would say they're quality, quality people. So I'd like to be a guy that's considered was part of that game, you know, in, in that way. Our guest today has been Sean Bur- Berkey. Thanks so much for joining us. Anytime. If you want to do it again, I'm... We'll, we'll get you on that guitar next time and I'll grab one. We'll play, we'll play a little duet. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. 